Thank you, Micah, and thank you, church, for that warm welcome today. Micah and I have been texting back and forth this week about how nice it's going to be to be able to tag team together this week in leadership, and so I, I count it a real privilege to, to stand here before you today to speak. And in standing here before you today, I want to be honest with you about some challenges that I now face. This uh, past summer, I had a couple of brain surgeries in uh, Salt Lake City. And what led up to those surgeries was a real severe dizziness. I mean, I could be sitting still in a chair, but the room would be still moving. And uh, it was very, very challenging. Uh, Maybe even worse, though, than the dizziness was the pronounced double vision. I had two distinct images for everything I looked at, no matter what it was. And these surgeries uh, greatly helped. And uh, today, I only have double vision when when I look down. Some of you will note that my notes are down. (laughs) And you figured out that this sermon's going to take twice as long as it normally would. I see two distinct images when I look down at my notes. But I realize, though, that my weaknesses do not need to hinder the Lord's ability to speak to us today on this important theme, and as we conclude this series titled, Waiting. I read an interesting stat a while back. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but did you know that that on average, We spend seven years of our life waiting. We wait in line at the grocery store. We we wait for the movie to begin. We wait for a meal to be served. And if you frequent the Big Dipper here in Missoula, I believe the average is something like 14 years of your life (laughs) waiting. But Advent means waiting. And waiting is especially true of this fourth part of our Advent series. We believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and today, Christ our coming King. Now, I was raised in a pastor's home. My dad led churches all while I grew up, and I I guess in some sense I just always believed and lived with the idea that one day the Lord is coming again. But I realize that that's not everyone's experience. And so today I want to ask, where in the Bible do we get this idea that Christ is coming again? We're going to take the time this morning to go through a a number of Bible passages that are at the foundation of this teaching. And the first verse that we're going to look at together is set, it's following Christ's or Jesus' resurrection from the grave. And after he was with his disciples in various contexts over many days, the time eventually came for him to go to be with his father. And so when the disciples were all together one day, that's exactly what happened. The Lord was taken up. And they're all standing there looking like, what just happened? And suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And they said to the disciples in Acts 1.11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so once they uh, sort of came to their senses a little bit, they, they probably remembered Jesus talking about this. They might have remembered that at one point, Jesus was with them before he was arrested, and and he said to his disciples, as we see recorded in John 14, 
in my Father's house are many rooms. Now, I, when I memorized this passage of Scripture, it was from a different translation, and, and the words were, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now this is a a very important passage because it gives us the reason for heaven. And it leads me to ask about your perspective on heaven. What will be the best part of heaven? Maybe you think of heaven as the place where there will be no more tears. Possibly you think of heaven as a place where there will be no more pain or no more sickness or streets of gold or a really nice mansion. But I want to ask today, if you got to heaven and found that Jesus was not there, would you be okay with that? Maybe the gifts are what you are looking forward to as opposed to the giver. Jesus says in John 14 that the reason for heaven, this is it right here, the reason for heaven is where I am, there you may be also. The intended draw of heaven, the intended draw of Christ our coming King is that finally, we will be with Him. We will be with the Giver, Jesus. Now there are many other passages about Christ, our coming King. The Apostle Paul writes about what it will be like when He comes, 1 Thessalonians 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those Uh, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. I think of uh, various ones in our own church family this past year who are now with the Lord. I think of Neil Clout and Jeff Stott and Jim Flansburg. I think of Pauline Kaufman, each who have passed and are present with the Lord today. If the Lord were to return this afternoon, these and many, many others would rise first. And the passage continues, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Ah, think of it. The return of Christ will be a triumphant return. The Lord Himself will return. He's not going to send someone else. The Lord Himself will return. And it will be with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, something that is clear from the writers of the New Testament 
is that they expected this return to happen in their own lifetime. But it didn't happen in their lifetime, and now, now there are skeptics everywhere noting that it's been nearly 2,000 years, and he still hasn't come back. Second Peter chapter 3, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so God's gesture of patience in delaying the return of Christ will ultimately be misinterpreted. People will say, come on. Where is your God? Generations have passed and He still hasn't returned. You really think this expectation is anything other than fiction? And I, I have to say to you this morning, preparing for our time together has been so encouraging as I have um, looked at the Word, reviewing the various passages that speak of His return. And there are many other passages that we could look at today that would speak of Christ's return. But it helps me to understand now why the first century Christians greeted one another with a word, and it was Maranatha. That's the way they greeted one another when they first saw each other. And that means the Lord is coming. They believed it, and they lived as though it were true. But the overarching takeaway from the review of these verses is not when this return is going to happen, but that it will happen, just as he said. It's going to happen. And then another takeaway from these verses is that we must be ready for his return. Regardless what generation we live in, each has the responsibility of being ready for his coming. And so, with the time that remains, I, I want to take up that question of how do I ready myself for Christ our coming King? How do I ready myself for Christ our coming King? And there could be quite a list that we would develop here. But given the time frame this morning, I've, I've put just a few on this list. The question being, how do I ready myself for Christ, my coming King? And the first answer is to fix your eyes on the unseen. Fix your eyes on the unseen. I think of that Old Testament story in 2 Kings chapter 6. And there we see that the king of Aram is determined to kill Elisha, the prophet of God. And so he sends uh, his soldiers, lots of them, riding on horses and chariots with obvious evil intent to kill Elisha. And Elisha's servant sees this one morning early and he goes into a complete panic attack. He comes running to Elisha saying, Oh my Lord, what are we going to do? We don't stand a chance. In verse 16, Elisha says to his servant, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I can just imagine that servant thinking to himself, are you kidding me? There's two of us. Have you looked in the front yard? There's hundreds of horses and chariots with obvious evil intent. We are toast. We don't stand a chance. Verse 17, and Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. 
And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There was no threat at all. The Lord had opened the eyes of Elisha's servant so that he could see the unseen. Elisha was surrounded by the armies of God. Heaven's armies. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What would we see if we could see the unseen? What does it mean practically to fix your eyes on something that is unseen? Well, doesn't it mean that we would envision the kept promises of Jesus? Scripture says the return of the Lord is going to happen. To fix our eyes on the unseen would be to envision the coming of Christ our King. What will it be like? I mean, let's say the Lord returns this afternoon. What will it be like to be alive in this world and suddenly the dead in Christ are raised to life? What will it be like to hear the trumpet call of God when Christ returns in the same way He left the earth? What will it be like to be caught up together with those who have been raised to life to meet the Lord in the air? That is what Scripture says. That is going to happen. We must fix our eyes on that scene. That's one of the ways that we get ourselves ready for Christ our coming King. We fix our eyes on the unseen. We envision the kept promises of Jesus. Something else we must do as we ready ourselves for, re for His return is to wait patiently. The Lord is patient in coming again and His patience is giving further opportunity to people to turn to Him and place their faith in Him. And for us, this waiting patiently for His return is more than looking out the window and putting in time until He comes. You know, in fact, sometimes it can be helpful to think about the opposite of something. What would it be like to wait impatiently? Well, it's the opposite of fixing our eyes on the unseen. In fact, it would be like being drawn in different directions. You know, a phrase that I uh, like to quote every now and then goes like this. There once was a cowboy who got on his horse and then rode off in all directions. That would be a person without vision, right? A person with vision is going to fix their eyes on a target and they're going to head in that direction. And so in a world of endless options, that is the picture of patience heading in one direction. It's a long obedience in the same direction. That is patience. One more way that we ready ourselves for the Lord's return is to occupy until He comes. You know, if you're a follower of Christ today, God wanted you to be in His family. 
And it wasn't just so that you could occupy a seat at the table. He has something for you to do. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul writes about spiritual gifts. When you come into faith in Christ Jesus, you are given a unique spiritual gift that is to be used for the building up of God's people, His church. Paul wrote, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God has uniquely equipped every believer with a spiritual gift. A way for you to occupy until He comes. It's a unique way that you can invest yourself toward the building up of the body, the church. Each one of us needs to be asking, what is my role in the building up of the body the church. And that role may not come with a title. It may not be pastor or elder or teacher. It might rather be helper or giver. It might be in the realm of hospitality or encouragement or administration. But God has something for you to do and your role is critical. It's so important. It's the way you invest yourself until He comes again. Let me ask, do you know what that is for you? Are you occupying yourself with that role that He has given you? Staying in the game, as it were, is the way you occupy until he comes. You know, lately I've been reading the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, been meditating on Daniel's prophecy of end times. And much of my time has been focused in chapter 12 of that great book. In particular, the first few verses. There it reads There will be a time of distress. Such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Oh, you know, I keep thinking of these words in these recent weeks, that those who put others on the right path to life will shine like the stars above. That is what we are doing together as a church. We're working together to put ourselves and others on the right path to life, embracing and extending the life-changing grace and truth of Jesus. That's the vision that our pastor has put before us, and we do well to get on board with that vision. It's the way that we are to occupy until He comes. Now, Mike, Micah mentioned it earlier. Some of you know that I am in counseling now. And what that means for me is that day in and day out, I, I meet with clients. And one of my favorite comments from clients is this type of comment. A client will say, it feels so good 
to be known and also accepted. I love that. Maybe you've had that experience of being seen and pursued and heard and still accepted. That's a powerful thing. What an absolute tragedy it will be when Jesus says to some, depart from me, I never knew you. That is a quote from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. And in that passage, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. If there is anything we can take from that particular passage, if there's anything at all, it would be this, that it does not all work out in the end for everyone. Not everyone enters the kingdom of which Christ is king. Only those Christ knows will enter. And so be encouraged, church, each one of you whose faith is in Jesus Christ, the one who knows you is coming again. He is Christ our coming King. What a day it will be when we're finally with Him for eternity. The one who created you and pursued you and loves you and sees you and listens to you and knows you, you will finally be with Him where He is. You know, it's, uh, it's true that He is the giver. And it's true that He promises to give the gift of life to all who love and trust Him. I was thinking earlier this morning that it was uh, 53 years ago this week on Christmas Eve that I was sitting under my father's teaching in a little church in Canada. And my dad explained the gospel and then he gave an invitation for anybody that wanted to receive Christ as their Savior. And I, sitting there in a metal folding chair, with my head bowed, I responded. And that was the beginning of my walk with the Lord. And I have zero regret. And I want to say to you today that there may be those in this room who have never taken that step who have never said, I am placing my trust, I'm putting all my cards, as it were, on Jesus. I want Jesus to be the leader and the Lord of my life. I want Him to transform me. I want to come into His family. And you've never done that. As we conclude this morning, I want to offer a prayer that may be an example of how you might pray where you sit today to invite Jesus into your life. Will you bow your head with me? Ah, oh, Father, you are the giver. And you're coming again to take all who love and trust you to heaven. The purpose being that we might be where you are. 
And Father, it occurs to me today that there may be some in this room who do not have the insurance that they will be included at that time. And yet, Lord, you've wanted for each one of us to have assurance. There are many promises in your New Testament that give us such assurance. But Father, they all point to our love and trust of your Son, Jesus. And God, this morning, by way of example, I invite others to join me in saying, God, I need you. I need all that you accomplished on your cross to be applied to me. I invite you, God, to make me one of your children, to bring me into your family, that I might have that wonderful hope of your return where I will be with you where you are. And so, Lord, as best I can say it, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Transform my heart. Make me into one of your children. Give me that glorious hope for the future. Amen.